Hello and welcome to worship today. It's Sunday, September the 13th of 2020. A reminder that the words for today's hymns are found in the printed sermon document immediately below the worship video on the St. Columba website. Let us praise the name of the Lord together. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love. As far as the east is from the west, so far God removes our transgressions from us. So let us rejoice in God's presence. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Holy and loving one, God of might and mercy, the heavens and the earth are full of your glory. Your love transforms our lives. You take darkness and give light. You take grief and give healing. You take fatigue and give strength. You take fear and give courage. You take death and give new life. We give you thanks that we are able to gather in this time together to lift our hearts in praise and worship. What a blessing to be with you and in spirit with one another. Bless us all as we worship this day and help us adjust to a new approach to worship with openness, patience, and grace. And so we come before you in worship, handing to you all that weighs us down, waiting for your refreshing gifts. Renew us in this time of worship, we pray, so that we may serve you in Jesus' name. O oh God, we confess that our lives do not always reflect your transforming power. You are gracious, but we cling to judgment. You are kind, but we can be cruel. You are forgiving, but we nurse grudges and old wounds. You are filled with joy, but too often we are filled with dissatisfaction and complaints. Forgive us, O God, and fill us with your Holy Spirit this day, and make us new through Christ your Son and our Savior. Amen. Friends, the proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Know that you are forgiven by his grace and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
Let us pray. God of all knowledge, prepare our hearts and minds to receive your wisdom. Quiet in us all distracting thoughts so that we may hear your word and be strengthened to follow your way. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. In the ninth chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, the apostle reminds his readers of what used to be with regard to worship and sacrifice before Jesus came. There were strict regulations regarding worship in the earthly tabernacle, with two rooms, the outer room containing the consecrated bread and the inner room housing the Ark of the Covenant. Only the high priest could enter the inner room, the most holy place, once a year, and not without a blood offering for his own sins and the sins of the people. But, the author writes, this did not clear the conscience of the worshiper. But then Christ came and entered the most holy place that is not of this world, and he entered by his own blood. His sacrifice cleanses the conscience of sinners. Those who believe receive the promise of redemption and life. Christ was sacrificed once for many. And when he returns, he will not bear sin, but will save those who are waiting for him. And so we continue with the words of the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 10, reading verses 1 through 25. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week, we began a series of three meditations on the fall festivals of the Old Testament. We reflected on the Feast of Trumpets, during which the people celebrate the beginning of creation and take seriously the coming judgment on the behavior of God's people. It is a time to be lauded with the blast of ram's horns or trumpets in acknowledgement of what God has done, is doing, and has promised. In the Christian church, we acknowledge the same past, present, and promise through the sacrament of the Lord's table in which we give thanks for and are humbled by what God has done, is doing, and has promised through the body and blood of Christ. Today we're going to give our attention to another festival of the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur. In the Old Testament, preaching was a dangerous job. It fell to priests to stand in the gap between the holy God and the stained and defiled people. Priests entered into the holy place and the most holy place in the tabernacle. They trod on ground that others dared not. When the Lord God spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, who died when they approached the Lord, he said, don't go there lest you die. When the high priests went into the most holy place, they had a rope tied around their ankles so that they could safely be pulled out in case they were struck down. I can't imagine. Although I can picture how well it would turn out if I had a rope tied around my ankles every time I entered the pulpit. Preaching is risky enough without physical dangers. The emergency room, they'd know me by my first name. Jewish texts tell us that Yom Kippur was the one day on which the high priest was to enter the most holy place in the tabernacle. The high priest was to perform a series of rituals that were to atone for the sins of the people so that he could ask forgiveness for them. After the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD, Yom Kippur became a ritual for individual rabbis and congregations in their synagogues. Observant Jews consider Yom Kippur and the days leading up to it a time for prayer, good deeds, reflecting on past mistakes, and making amends with others. The Day of Atonement occurs 10 days after the Feast of Trumpets. It's the highest of the Jewish holy days and is traditionally understood to be the day on which God decides each person's fate. Therefore, each one is to make amends and ask forgiveness for sins committed during the past year. This is followed by a 24-hour fa- a 25-hour fast and a special traditional service. During that worship service, the rabbi leads from a special book. Five distinct prayer services take place on Yom Kippur, the first on the eve of the holiday and the last before sunset on the following day. One of the most important prayers specific to this day describes the atonement ritual performed by high priests during ancient times. As with the Feast of Trumpets, A long blast of the ram's horn is to sound at the end of the final service to signal the end of the fasting period. The symbols of the Day of Atonement are the pre-Yom Kippur feast, 
the breaking of fast with comfort foods, the wearing of white, and making donations or volunteering time with a charity as a way to atone and seek God's forgiveness. It's a rather elaborate observance, the most important one of the Jewish year combined with Rosh Hashanah. What a beautiful way to keep the traditions handed down by ancestors in the faith. One of the ways Yom Kippur is described, it is the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Hall of Famer Sandy Koufax, one of the most famous Jewish athletes in American sports, made national headlines when he refused to pitch in the first game of the 1965 World Series because it fell on Yom Kippur. When Koufax's replacement, Don Drysdale, was pulled from the game for poor performance, he told the Los Angeles Dodgers manager, I bet you wish I was Jewish too. Such a level of commitment to this expression of faith. And this is the level to which Jesus calls us in our discipleship, worship, and service. But do we commit to that level? Do we make it our highest life-guiding priority? Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. Unswervingly. The word brings to mind several car advertisements. The ones for vehicles with alerts for when you're veering out of your lane when you don't mean to. If you leave your lane, the car beeps at you and draws your attention back to what you're supposed to be doing, driving, instead of whatever has distracted you out of your lane. The mother, looking in her rearview mirror, telling her kids in the back seat to settle down, is one I've seen most recently. Unswervingly means we are steady, unremitting, solidly committed. The author of Hebrews tells us to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess because the one in whom we find that hope is unswervingly faithful to us. The author also says we are to encourage one another in loving and in doing good and that we are not to give up meeting together as apparently some in the community had done. You see, right from the first century, a commitment to the church is a habit easily broken. I recently heard of a church leader who brought an end to online services as the church reopened because people had said they would not bother going out to worship if they could stay home and watch. Now, I must admit, I will miss sitting with my family with a cup of coffee to watch worship on Sunday mornings. I could have told the session that I was not comfortable going back to the sanctuary so I could continue to enjoy those times, but that would have been abusive of my position as moderator of the session and a minister of word and sacrament. It also would have shown a terrible disrespect toward those whose reason for continuing to worship at home is a legitimate health concern, either for themselves or for their families, in this uncertain time of pandemic. I have no reason not to be physically present with others at worship at this time. Some of our church family have very good reasons, and I dare say would very much like to be in the sanctuary again on Sunday mornings. But that isn't what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. He's talking about those who have simply stopped gathering for worship. They have given up as if they were breaking a habit. 
One of my favorite preachers and theologians, Thomas Long, wrote an article about atonement in the book of Hebrews. He begins by telling the story of what he calls his first failure in ministry, right after he unpacked his books. A woman came to him declaring her disbelief that God could forgive her, that God stood in constant judgment of her. There was no specific sin she had committed that led her to this conclusion. Long tried everything he had been taught in seminary to help her see the grace of God's forgiveness, assured through faith in Christ, but to no avail. She simply could not believe she could be forgiven. Years later, as Long was writing a commentary on Hebrews, he remembered the woman and realized that she was just the kind of person for whom the author of the letter, or rather the sermon, had written these words. The author was a preacher and pastor laboring to provide care and comfort to a congregation worn down by a religion that does not seem to heal, fatigued by the burdens of a conscience that will not be cleansed, exhausted by a Jesus who appears unable to help. This community has a very real problem of conscience and needs to feel they are forgiven, not just know it intellectually. And so this author's goal is to preach the gospel so that it communicates God's grace that atones. This is a congregation of people growing weary of the Christian life, becoming tired of church and the demands of discipleship. They have become apathetic and drifted away. Perhaps some have paid an economic or social price for their commitment. Attendance is down. Theological understanding is ebbing away and they are exhausted. They are giving up. All of the work they are doing, the rules they are following, are not assuring them of the forgiveness they seek. They cannot rest. They have lost the joy of faith in God. The same can happen in the lives of Christian people today, in churches today. People wear themselves out for Jesus because they feel they have to. But it doesn't bring the peace they seek. It doesn't renew their joy. Long tells another story of a minister that made the observation that congregations seeking a new minister were including in the list of qualifications a good sense of humor. He wondered why the need to state something so obvious. Who wants a minister that doesn't laugh? Perhaps, it was wondered, it was because someone witty with a light touch and a smile could be the last line of defense against a doleful faith, a fearsome view of God, and a missing sense of genuine gladness at the heart of worship and discipleship. If we cannot be joyful, he said, at least we can grin. The Jewish Day of Atonement has its focus placed on repentance and forgiveness. The many traditions and rituals to mark this day have reminded God's people of the need for forgiveness for generations. As the Christian church, we are regularly reminded of this need as we confess our sins and are are assured of God's forgiveness through the sacrifice Christ made once for all, for those who would believe. We don't need to perform elaborate rituals to know this. We need to read the gospel and be reminded by the New Testament writers that we do not live our lives in guilt because Christ has transformed our guilt into hope. He's dealt with it, done forever for believers. The level of commitment we see in the Jewish community on the Day of Atonement is an example we can follow every day. 
as we acknowledge our sins before God and receive forgiveness through Christ. It takes work. It takes a high level of commitment. But when we live as those who live within that hope, the habit becomes pretty easy to keep. We do not give up because God does not give up on us through our faith in Christ. Amen. Our hymn is Come Ye Disconsolate. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, O God, because you have blessed us with so much. Yet we know that others have too little. We have been given the opportunity to offer our praise and worship this day, as well as our hearts and our financial gifts. May the offerings we share in the sanctuary and online become a source of healing and justice in the world for the sake of Jesus Christ, the one who sends us out in love. God of light and hope, we pray for those who face lives filled with darkness, those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, those bent under burdens of sorrow, those who cannot see the way ahead. We pray for those who accompany others in dark times and places, for those who comfort the grieving and work for healing and new possibilities. May all these find their darkness transformed by your presence. God of liberation and justice, we pray for those who suffer abuse, violence, or injustice at the hands of powerful people or forces in their lives, and for those who have been betrayed by people entrusted with their care. Stir in all people a deep respect for life. Encourage those who struggle for freedom and work for truth to be heard and reconciliation achieved. God of peace and promise, we pray for those who work for peace in the world for leaders and decision makers, for those who hold power and can make a difference in their communities, and for those who make, interpret, and enforce laws. Awaken a respect for the needs of the most vulnerable, including the earth and its fragile balances. God of wisdom and understanding, 
We pray for those who misunderstand the words and actions of others and for those who are misunderstood. We pray for those who teach and those who learn, especially those who struggle and are afraid to ask for help. In this challenging school year, guide teachers and students in new patterns of learning and keep each one safe and healthy. God of forgiveness and reconciliation, we pray for those we have hurt or offended and for those to whom we have been unkind. We pray for those who have hurt us or been careless with our feelings. Work in our lives to redeem broken relationships. Shape us into gracious and forgiving people. Lord, in the silence, we name before you the concerns on our minds today. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for we offer them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn is There is a Redeemer. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of you now and always. Amen.